How many times do you think of that song just out of the blue and you sing, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. It's a, it's a great song to come up and a great thing to remember that despite everything happening in our lives and in the world, that there's one thing that stands sure is that Jesus loves me. Amen. We're going to be continuing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 this morning. And... Uh, it's always, uh, it's, it's an exciting chapter, chapter. I don't know where I'm going to start or where I'm going to end from week to week in this chapter because there's so much happening. And yet, at a, on a casual reading of it, it looks like, oh, that's a piece of cake, no problem. But, but what we're, what we're going to be looking at today is we're going to be looking at specifically verses 13, 14, and 15 in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, but I want to start off by reading, again, the whole chapter and, and see the things that we can pick out between, uh, between the beginning of the chapter and where we're in in the chapter. There's some, uh, there's some very common things going on. It says, verse number one says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the, min, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, or to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And, and Lord, we just pray that you would add your blessing to your word this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Something that I, I hope you caught is this, this part in 2 Thessalonians of those who perish and those who are damned. There was a reason for both of those, that both are equal together, Back in verse number 10, it says, And with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish. This is, going to be, this is going to be who is going to be captivated by the work of the Antichrist. Why will they perish? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Remember in, in, in chapter 1, 
we saw that they, or uh, chap, uh, First Thessalonians 1, in the first chapter, we saw that they, they believed the word in all their afflictions. Or they received and believed the word in all their afflictions. Down to uh, verse number 11, I want to touch a little bit on the strong delusion today as well. But verse 12, they're going to get the strong delusion that God is going to send in verse 11, that they all might be damned. Damnation to them, that they'll, they'll perish. Who believe not the truth. Why, did, why do people go to hell today? And why then as well? Because they don't believe the truth. Even Jesus said it, it people are condemned already because they believe not. They were in, uh, uh, in, in John chapter 3. It says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. I think the, the Burger King analogy fits pretty good there. But what happens, our opponents of the gospel will say, God is, is horrible. Because he, he, ju he is taking some people and deluding them, and other people, he's giving them life. This is the, the false doctrine of election that's found throughout Christendom today. I, spelled, I didn't call it Christendom, but D-U-M-B, Christendom. Right? The reason for damnation, the reason for perishing is not receiving the truth. Now, what about the strong delusion? I thought, oh, man, I, I always give the same analogy. Just have it your way. Things are going to get so bad. Romans chapter 1, God is going to give people up to what they want. And that's basically the, the truth. But I want to go to a couple places in the, in the scriptures here. I want to go back. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. How many people do you know, or perhaps yourself, that think the parables were there to make the things easier to explain. They're not there for that reason. Matthew chapter 13. Let's go down to, uh, let's go to verse 13. Verse 13 says, Therefore speak I to them, who are them? Them are, them are the scribes and Pharisees and, the, and those leaders. They speak in parables because they seeing not and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any times they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So we see that, we see that, that the idea is, is the leaders of Israel... They didn't pay attention to the prophets. They were just like their fathers before. They did everything that was right in their own eyes. They created laws unto themselves. They did not believe God himself. Let's go over to, uh, it's a late edition here. I just, just added it just now. John chapter 10. John chapter 10.
All right. Let's go to, let's start with verse 27. It says, my sheep hear my voice. Obviously, the scribes and the Pharisees weren't their sheep or his sheep at the time. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You're in good hands with Allstate. <laughs> How do we remember that? You know, you're in good hands. Jesus is in the Father, and they're together. They keep a person secure in themselves. Jesus answered, uh, then, I, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. You think they would have gotten the point I, uh, by now that, that Jesus was telling the truth. They, they wouldn't receive him. They wouldn't recognize him as such. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? Uh, verse 33 now, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Jesus answered answer them, Is it not written in your law? I said ye are gods. In other words, they had an elevated status in Israel. They were leaders. They should have known what was going on. They should have known the prophecies regarding Jesus, etc. Jesus took that from Psalm 82. Again, pointing to the, the leaders of Israel that should have known prophecy. They should have known what was going on. Verse 35, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe, me, uh, believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. This is kind of a, going backwards, talking about the Antichrist, that he wouldn't regard the God of his fathers, which I believe are the patriarchs, the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and through the neither would he regard any other God. And last week is where I had to, I had to go back and listen. I spoke circles around myself even about it. Ultimately, the, the gods were of man's, man's making. The leaders of the world, the Caesars, the, the pharaohs, those are all titles. They weren't, they, they weren't actual names. So when you, hear, when you hear the name Caesar, think Kaiser with a hard K, the Kaiser, the Kaiser Wilhelm. He didn't regard the leaders, the kings of his world. He was a god, or thinking he was a god unto himself. This will be the time when that strong delusion comes, when, when he's in that position, well, he is going to claim that he's the only god. There is no other competition around, no king of this world, nothing. He's going to make a carte blanche statement. But I want to get back to back on course here. I just wanted to run that through for a second. I think after I rethought about it, the being gods, the leaders of this world were considered gods. The Romans, uh, they, they worshipped. The Caesar was, was to be worshipped. He elevated himself to a point of worship. It's amazing how absolute power corrupts absolutely. And even men in leadership positions will take on a higher level for themselves, thinking that they're gods. It still happens today as well. There are people that actually think they're more powerful than God himself. Well, let's get back on track here for a second about, the, about, those, uh, about being blinded not, and, and, uh, and being judged. While we're in the book of John, let's go to John 12. John 12. Let's 
Verse number uh, 37. I, I like how, I still like how the Bible start, starts off sentences with but. <laughs> Not just a conjection, but. Oh, well, what's, what's the but there for? Jesus saying, while ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Remember, the, the signs were for the Jews. The Greeks require wisdom. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? They would have read Psalm 53 no matter what. No matter what their position was, they would have known that psalm. But yet, they didn't believe it. I was thinking of, of all the prayers that I recited when I was a kid. Never really listened to what they were doing. Never really listened to what they were saying, rather. Just went along with it, just to get along. Here's these prayers you need to pray. I think I've, I, I think I've told this story one time when traveling with a family. We had 15 of us in a 12-passenger van, driving at midnight around, uh, down Route 81, in, uh, down through Pennsylvania. And if you've traveled that way around, around uh, Wilkes-Barre and everything, it's very mountainous. And I happened to be driving. I was usually the designated driver because I think I was the only one crazy enough to tolerate everybody, all the people in the, the van. All of a sudden, I hear... From the back, I hear my wife's grandmother back there. She goes, going like that. So I had just newly been saved. I, I said, listen, if you're going to pray something, pray it like you mean it. So I decided to lead the whole van in the rosary. That's what they were doing, but they were just going through whatever the mandatory amount. Well, 10, rows, 10, 10 decades or, or 10 recitations of the rosary will be safe. So I said, pray it like you mean it. So I was from the front seat. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Slow as can be. Wouldn't you know everybody got mad at me for doing that? My only point was, you're just going through this. It's just words. Just vain repetition. And I think that's a tragedy why so many can, can pray those things their whole life and not understand the meaning of it. Like, uh, like several years ago, I did a whole a series about the kingdom using the Lord's Prayer. How that wasn't for us. That's a future. That's for the Jews, for the kingdom, the literal earthly kingdom to come. Let me get off of that subject. But, but the reality is, is those leaders in Israel, they would, have been, they would have been familiar with, they would have known what's in that psalm like the back of their hand, but they never stopped to realize what it really said. Did I finish yet, or did I, get, did I get stopped there? Yeah, he hath, he, uh, therefore they could not believe, verse 39, believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. In two tragic verses. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men, more than the praise of God. Yes, there's a draw still today of lofty positions of power rather than being of God.
I was going to end right there, but let's, let's continue. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. This is what Jesus came into the world to do, and he was rejected by the leaders by the, and, the, and most of the people of the nation. Let's go, speaking of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. Just two verses, just gets the, uh, the idea, because this has been quoted already. Isaiah 6. It's such a short chapter, too. But, but let's just go to verse, verse number 8. Also, I heard the voice, not that verses 1 through 7 are slouches or anything, but also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I always scratch my head and say, Isaiah didn't really know what he was getting himself into at this point, I don't think. But he had just seen the glory of God. He saw, he saw the presence of the Lord, so everything that he would go through was nothing compared to being with the Lord. Verse number 9, And he, and he said, Go and tell this people, he, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. God knew that he was going to be rejected, but yet go and tell them. Go and tell them. Go, go and, and, and speak the message to him. But he knew that he wasn't going to be received. It's amazing how that happens with the Lord. But God doesn't just willy-nilly send people to hell or bring strong delusion to them. Strong delusion had been taking place already. They were deluding, deluded from believing the truth, even more so. And here's a funny story in 1 Kings 22. We need to have a funny story. I find it funny anyways. 1 Kings 22. I don't know how long into this funny story we'll get. This is about King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. And Ahab had the idea that they could join together and they could, they could beat the enemy. And, and Jehoshaphat uh, and Jehoshaphat, he's the smart one of the two, by the way. He says, why don't we go to the Lord with this? Why don't we see what God has to say? So we'll read it, starting with verse number one. And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, 
and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou... Electronics malfunctioning here. And the king of Israel said unto his servant, Know ye that Ramoth Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go down with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Je Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. He said, Let's go to the Lord today. Let's see what he has to say about this. And of course, where would you go to hear the, from the Lord you would go to your prophets. All right? Look at the verse, next verse. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together. Now, God was already set to judge Ahab because of his wickedness. Remember, three chapters before in 1 Kings 18, we have, we have the, the prophets of Baal were defeated by Elijah, just ridden of them. So here is, here, is, uh, uh, here is the king of Israel, Ahab. He says, let's go, let's get the prophets, about 400 men. So he had 400 prophets. It's a lot of prophets. He had already had a record of, of having prophets, not of God, but of Baal. Ahab and Jezebel, they were the most wicked king and queen going. They brought, they brought idolatry into, the Isra into Israel. And look what happens here. He said, he got the 400 men, in verse 6, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Of course. They did whatever Ahab wanted them to say. Then the king of uh, and Jehoshaphat, verse 7, said, Is it not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we may inquire of him? He says, don't you have a prophet of the Lord? You have all these others. And the king of Israel, verse 8, said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Have your own way. <laughs> Have it your way, Ahab. That's going to be the, the motto or the message of this, this story. But I hate him. Okay, the interviewer now says... Why would you hate a guy like Micaiah who tells the truth? I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me. He was the, the, the Benny Hinn of his day. You're going to have all wealth, health, prosperity. Everything's going to go good for you, O king. Does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. You've got to be kidding me. You can't, you... He, he, he knows that Jehoshaphat, or, or that Micaiah, is the one telling the truth, the one prophet that told the truth against the 400 false prophets. Verse number 10, And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their... Uh, oh, wait a minute. I missed one. Then, verse 9, Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither Micaiah, the son of Imlah. Verse 10, And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. So they both sat there outside of the capital of, outside of, the capital of, of Israel, Samaria, and Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chenanah, 
made him horns of iron, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou shalt push the Syrians until you have, uh, till thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. So they, all the prophets were, were saying, It's going to go good. You're going to crush the king of Syria. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. To which I say, ha, ha, ha. Listen to what he does. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Interesting. Micaiah gave the same message as the other prophets. Hmm, what else is going on here? Think strong delusion from the Lord. Think getting, getting Ahab literally on his high horse to be cut down. That's what will, what will happen here. Verse number 16, And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? <laughs> I love that. Say, what? Say, what? Tell me what's going on. What does, what does the Lord really want me to say? I know you can't be telling the truth this time because you're agreeing with everybody that agrees with me. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, verse number 17. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. Who was the shepherd here in Israel at the time? It was Ahab. So he's saying, I saw them as one having no shepherd. Right? Going in, in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? Verse number 19, and he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and one and another said on that manner. And there came, a for, it came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. So already, what had happened was the Lord wanted Ahab to go up. Not so that he could deliver or, or beat the Syrians, but so that he could be judged and killed for his sin. Yeah, God set that up. Verse number uh, 23 now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. So you know, all right, here's the truth. All the prophets are liars, and he's spoken evil of you. But Zedekiah the son of Chenna went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back into Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I come in peace." And Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. 
So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on, on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. That's how the Lord got Ahab to go into battle. I think that was that lying spirit that was talking to Ahab, thinking that he was hearing from God. I get a bright idea. You're going to hide right out in the front in the battle lines. You're going to hide right there, and guess what would happen to him? You know the end of the story. But the king of Syria commanded his 30 and two captains that had rule over his chariot, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. Now, here was Ahab being set up. He had Micaiah in jail. And I think he was trying to set up Zedekiah as well, because he told him to stay in his place. Put your robes on. I don't think the Syrians had, had any idea that there'd be an allegiance between Ahab and Zedekiah, that he would be there, that, that Ahab would be there doing his kingly thing. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, surely it is the king of Israel, and they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. Mission foiled. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness, wherein he said unto the driver of a chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even, and the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, every man to his city and every man to his own country. Just like Micaiah said, there'd be peace. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor according to, unto the word of the Lord, which he spake. Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory house which he made and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the, of the kings of Israel? So Ahab slept with his fathers and Ahaziah his son reigned in his stead. And that's where we're going to end that. What a story that only could be fulfilled by God. Ahab, thinking he was so smart that he would, he would become king over the whole country. But yet, God knew better. God sent that spirit to him, that strong delusion to Ahab that he thought he could outsmart, outsmart, yeah, outsmart God himself. That's strong delusion right there that Ahab had. He already had certain judgment that was going against him, but he thought he could trick God and everybody else out of judging him. Let's go over to Revelation. Revelation chapter 6. I meant Revelation 9, I'm sorry. I had Revelation 6 on my brain. Just two verses at the end of the uh, chapter. 
And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither, neither repented they of their sorceries, uh, of, of their murderers, of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. They had just seen these three demonic beings pouring out judgment on the earth, and they would not still turn. In this case, they would, they would turn from their sin. They would, still would not believe in the Messiah. Now let's go while we're in Revelation. Revelation chapter 16. Otherwise, I'd go back into, uh, into Thessalonians. I only have this fresh because I saw a post about this online last night. Verse 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his, his, his shame. And they gather them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Those that go through the tribulation are either going to get martyred or they're going to endure to the end. But those who, who get destroyed, who get judged, it's the Lord comes as a thief to them. Why? Strong delusion. They're going to believe in the Antichrist system throughout. They're going to go, they're going to accept the mark of the beast. They're going to do all these things and go into that tribulation or stay in that tribulation. And it's, it's amazing how I can't even fathom today why people can't accept the simple truth of the gospel. We're not under that strong delusion yet. There are a lot of deluded people Remember, after, at, during the apostasy, and, and the church is gone, that apostasy uh, is going to ramp up even more. The strong delusion is going to ramp up because there's nothing, nothing to withhold. The body of Christ, the Spirit of God indwelling will not be in the world. Not negating that the Spirit of God does not work during the tribulation working through the people who endure the tribulation, working through the 144,000, working through the two witnesses, all these different things. But there'll be great lying signs and wonders at the same time. So why would I, why would I believe in being delivered by Christ if I can have all these things that I'm promised by, by his, the imposter? That's the answer or the question that we have to think of then. You know, what? Why is, the, why is Jesus Christ and believing on him so compelling? I'm going to close today without actually getting to the uh, message. Why is the gospel so compelling for us, but so repelling to those that are perishing? Right? Why is it a sweet savor of Christ to those of us who believe, and yet it's the smell of death to those who don't believe? I know what it is. The God of this world has blinded their eyes so they will not see the truth. The God of prosperity. The God, of, the God who likes to keep things right now. You need the newest fad, you need the newest thing, the biggest waves and wind of doctrine. You need those changes. But yet the gospel stands true. The, the gospel, like the book of Hebrews, it's, it's an anchor for the soul. Jesus Christ is that anchor. When you're compelled to drift, that anchor holds. Oh, what's that song? It's anchor holds within the veil. Amen.
So that's what the, the peace we have is in Christ Jesus and in Him alone. I was thinking whether I wanted to go to a couple more verses, but we have communion, which we'll take now. So our trust is in the Lord and what He did at the cross of Calvary. Amen?